Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, lecture for the 2023 speaker series uh, of the Royal Turrell Museum, generously supported by the Royal Turrell Museum's Cooperating Society. And today we will have Dr. Ellen Curano speaking uh, about fossil plants from Wyoming. Uh, Dr. Ellen Curano is a paleontologist at the University of Wyoming who studies how ancient forest communities responded to environmental changes. She has ex excavated fossil plants on six continents with most time spent in the Wyoming Badlands and Ethiopia. Ellen received an undergraduate degree in geology and biology from the University of Chicago and a PhD in geosciences from Penn State. Her research has been supported by the US National Science Foundation and National Geographic. She also co-founded the Bearded Lady Project, challenging the face of science in 2014, and remains a vocal advocate for diversity and inclusivity in STEM. So uh, thank you and welcome, Dr. Kirano. All right, thank you very much, Dr. West. Okay, great. Well, thank you all so much for um, for being here this morning. Um, I am speaking to you from my office at the University of Wyoming, which is on the ancestral and traditional lands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Crow, and Shoshone indigenous peoples, along with other native peoples who call the Great Basin and Rocky Mountain region home. And so what I'd like to do today, I'm gonna to start off by introducing myself um, and telling you a little bit about my, my passion project, the Bearded Lady Project, which is aimed at um, putting using science and art to put a smile on your face and get you to think about what stereotypes exist and how we can increase diversity in our STEM fields. And then I will transition into the amazing life of being a paleontologist and getting to go out in the field and time travel and investigate ancient Earth. Okay, so this is me at two and a half years old. I grew up in Chicago, so lots of buildings, lots of culture, lots of concrete, not a lot of nature and outdoors. And so like many people from cities, my family would go on road trips to national parks to get to experience the wonders of the outdoors. So at two and a half, my family went out to Badlands National Park in South Dakota. And we joke that this is my origin story. This is when it became clear that I would be a geologist and paleontologist. And so this rock that I'm holding here, which in the picture doesn't look very special and I don't know why it's special now, but at two and a half, I thought this was the most amazing rock ever and I needed to take it home and very carefully study it. And my parents said, no, we're in a national park. You are not allowed to take anything and I threw a tantrum and people could hear me for miles. Um, and so this was kind of our, you know, joking, like this is when Ellen decided to go into science. At five, I got in introduced to dinosaurs when I was in kindergarten. And then I was hooked on paleontology and I had these dreams of getting to travel the world and excavate fossils. College and grad school let me have my first um, experience living out that dream. And it was just a wonderful time. I worked in Wyoming. My PhD advisor took me to Patagonia to work there. And then as a postdoc, I started working in Ethiopia. And so just incredible time, super jazzed by science, super jazzed going out in the field and feeling very, very supportive. And one of the reasons for that is that I had these two amazing near peer role models, uh, Dr. Cindy Loy and Caroline Stromberg. Um, they were postdocs when I was finishing my grad work and I could look at them and say, okay, I can finish my PhD, I can go on to a postdoc, and I can go on to a faculty position. And so I went on to a faculty position, and then it became apparent that there were many times when I would be the only woman in the room or in the field site, and when I would really have to fight to hear, have my voice heard and to be taken seriously. And I just love this picture down here. So this is down in Patagonia. These are fantastic and very supportive uh, paleobotanists. So this is not at all a knock on them, but 
this picture is kind of a symbol for my early career. So here I am in the background working hard, hammering rocks. And it's just like, hey, I'm here in the background. Pick me. Look at me. I'm doing cool things. Um, and so just kind of broadening out for a second. So we don't often see a lot of images or actual female paleontologists. And so we could look at our US scene, 20% of US geoscience faculty are women. We could look at our professional societies. We can look at who is being recognized in our professional societies. And it's not very often women. And sometimes it even seems like, you know, you turn on the TV and you have this fictional world and it can also be challenging in the fictional world to find wonderful uh, representation of women in science. And so just kind of some fun data from the Gina Davis Institute. So this is looking at TV roles. And now this data is, I guess it's a little older now. I'd be interested to see if things have changed in the last 10 years. Um, but so in these TV roles, it's a seven to one ratio of men to women in STEM and STEM means science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And then, of course, in our paleo world, if we think about our fictional paleontologists, we're maybe going to think of Alan Grant or Ross Geller. Um, I, I have an eight month old, and so I don't often have an opportunity to really sit down and watch a, an almost three hour movie. But I had the new Jurassic World movie on in the background one day while I was taking care of the baby. And it was, it was sort of fascinating and also emblematic to see that the Dr. Ellie Sattler, who'd been our paleobotanist in Jurassic Park, had, it seems that she had moved out of paleontology and into other scientific fields. So I, I thought that was kind of an in, intriguing little detail there. But, but I, am, I am here, I am trying to keep that from happening. And I lean on my friends to help me. Um, so this is my dear friend, Lexi Jameson Marsh. She is a filmmaker and a director, and she faces many of the same challenges that I do in terms of um, being an underrepresented group in her field. And we were having dinner one night back in 2014, uh, venting about the difficulties we were facing, advancing in our careers, being taken seriously in our careers. And I made the crack to Lexi, gosh, maybe I should just stick a beard on my face and people will take me seriously. Um, and Lexi, with her amazing, creative, intelligent mind, goes like, hey, that would be fun. You should do that. I'll come out in the field with you. We'll make a five-minute YouTube video. It'll be hilarious. And so we joked around with that for a while. And I thought, like, OK, this, is, this was a fun evening. I went home to bed. And the next morning, wake up to an email Lexi had sent me in the middle of the night saying, could we do this? Do you think other paleontologists who happen to be women would sign on as well? And I said, well, I don't know, but I trust you and let's give it a try. So we launched the Bearded Lady Project in summer, fall of 2014. Uh, in 2017, we finally got the last of the bills paid. Um, so, so that's great. Um, but in, in between that time, so Lexi, oh, I, sorry, I should say that um, we also brought in a third friend of ours, Kelsey Vance, who's a fine arts photographer. And so in addition to having what we initially thought would be a five minute YouTube video, we brought in Kelsey to take large format black and white photos of women doing their thing in their field sites, teaching their classes, doing lab work, but wearing beards. So over the course of a little over a year, Lexi and Kelsey traveled to 15 locations, and it turns out there were quite a lot of women who wanted to participate. So we had over 100 participants. And we collected amazing stories over the way, which we have in the film, which is free online on Vimeo, and then in a book that we published a couple years ago. One of the, the most jaw-dropping stories comes from Dr. Carol Hickman, who's a professor emeritus at Berkeley. And Dr. Hickman, when, when we approached her about participating in the project, said to us, 
I'll do it if I can bring my own mustache. Okay, well, we weren't expecting that, but absolutely, we're all about inclusivity. And so Dr. Hickman then reveals this tale of how in the 1970s, when she was doing field work in the Australian outback, she wore this mustache so she could be safe from harassment in her field site and so she could get her work done efficiently. Um, so in 2017, we premiered our short film. We started this traveling exhibition. There's a couple examples here of, of our portraits. And the exhibition just wrapped in February with the final showing at the Museum of the Rockies. Um, and so it's been just a super fun ride. It's been time consuming, but I think one of the, the beauty of this project is we, we've gone sort of minimalistic in terms of you're confronted, you're not confronted, you're asked to view these portraits and then it's a conversation starter. And I have heard such beautiful conversations about what stereotypes exist, why we have them and what we can do about them. So here I am, there's our, our little book there. Um, I get very little money for any copy sold. So don't feel like I'm trying to pressure you into buying it. Um, but it's this beautiful collection of essays by women who participated in our project. And I'd like to use a quote from one of those essays as my transition from this passion project of getting women involved in paleontology and keeping them in paleontology, and then the awesomeness of doing paleontology. So this is, this is a quote from Dr. Lislea Holosko, who is a paleoanthropologist at Berkeley. Dr. Holesko writes, I have sat on the edge of gorges and at the top of hills overlooking rocks that encapsulate millions of years of evolution, many of them containing the fossil remains of humanity's ancestors. I am not a woman at these moments. I am a human, I am a hominid. I am an animal feeling the direction of the wind on my face and the smell of the earth in my chest. I am one brief moment in the evolution of life. I am alive, I am nothing. I am part of everything, but these moments are fleeting. I think the first time I read this quote, I cried. It encapsulated a lot of what I felt. There's that incredible joy of being out in the field site and getting to forget who you are and being this brief moment in the evolution of life. And so I'd like to share a little bit of that with you. So this is what one of my typical field sites looks like. This is the Badlands in central Wyoming, in this case in the Wind River Basin. And these rocks that we're looking at here, this represents an ancient floodplain, and they're just chock full of amazing fossil plants. So we are going to take our shovels and we are going to go time traveling back to the early Paleogene Earth. So this is the time period that I have mostly worked on and that is incredibly well exposed in Wyoming. So we start the early Paleogene with the end of the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. And then in my case, I'm working up through about 45 million years ago. This is the warmest time period in Earth's recent history. Um, and so down here, we have one of our classic giant fern fronds from the Green River Formation in southwestern Wyoming. I said fern and I meant palm. I am so sorry about that. Uh, so we have these giant palm fronds here in Wyoming, and you can go all the way up into Canada, into Alaska, into the high Arctic, and still find some palm remains. So very, very warm time period, no ice sheets. I study plants and insects, and I do that because they're really fundamentally important to all life on Earth. So first off, these are the two groups that dominate biodiversity. And so here we have our biodiversity pie chart. We see that insects make up 
over half of all species on Earth, and this 925,000 here, that's probably an underestimate. Um, so insects the, are the most diverse group on Earth today, and probably from most of the geologic past. Um, and then the second most important group are our vascular plants. So this is looking at number of species, but the same pattern holds that plants and insects are really important if you look at biomass. So this was a really cool study that was done a couple years ago now, where the authors tried to estimate what is the mass of life on Earth and how is that distributed amongst the major groups. So in our box right here, this is meant to represent the total mass of life on Earth. And we can see that plants are the biggest component in that box. Plants are about 80% of biomass. And here is our little animal portion right here. And now we're gonna make that triangle into a box that is, so this is just looking at animal biomass. And the biggest portion of our animal biomass is the arthropods. And that uh, arthropods, it's not just insects, but insects is the biggest component within the arthropods. Okay, so these are two really, really important groups. With plants, you're looking at the bottom of the food chain, so everything else in terrestrial ecosystems defend, depends on them. With insects, um, the her herbivorous insects that I'm considering, okay, so they're eating the plants, and then also they're being eaten by many of our charismatic ver vertebrates. So super important groups. Okay, let's go back out into the field. So I am not a dinosaur paleontologist. I do not walk around looking at the ground or crawl around looking for little bits of bone fragments. What I'm doing is I am looking for rock layers that could have plant fossils within them. Um, and so I see an outcrop like this. I see that the rocks are browns and grays in color. And I see that there are some fine grain sediments. So like over here, those are sandstones. I'm not gonna find any plants in there. But in some of these darker, finer grained layers that represent a little bit farther away from the river system out on the floodplain, or in other places where I'm working, maybe these represent lake deposits. And that is where you're gonna find plant fossils. Okay, so I, I drive around, walk around, looking for, um, for vistas like this. And then I take my time traveling shovel, I dig in and I see, hey, are there, are there, is there any plant material in here? Are there nice fossils? And if there are nice fossils, then I might commit to digging a quarry. So we're making this nice exposure of good fossiliferous material and getting rid of all of the what we call overburden, the rock that just doesn't have great fossils in it. And so then we take our, um, that we call it the pay layer, and you're very carefully excavating it block by block splitting those blocks open and seeing what you find. Um, I tend to do more ecological work. And so I'm interested in how many species you find at a particular site and what's the distribution of those species. So I am really spending time looking at every single fossil and digging big holes to get a lot of fossils. Now, there is not room in museums for 500 leaves from the same site. So we do have to do a little bit of high grading. Um, and so some of the stuff gets left on the outcrop. The nicest stuff gets uh, wrapped up in toilet paper. I am very picky about my toilet papers um, and taken back to study in the labs and curated in the museums. Okay. Why do I have this? Oh yeah, I know why I have this. So this is our, our modern day Wyoming. This is the center of the state. This is our classic sagebrush steppe environment. And so in Wyoming, you're either in the sagebrush steppe or if you go up to higher elevations, you're in the alpine forest. And that is quite the contrast from the fossils that we're finding in these layers. 
So some of my favorite fossil plants that I've excavated in Wyoming. Um, and so from Northwestern Wyoming, uh, 56 million years ago, we have these incredible tropical bean tree leaves. Um, in an area that is today a very high elevation conifer forest, we see that 48 million years ago, you had this broad leafed forest dominated by sycamores. Um, again, just some, some beautiful plant fossils. So this is some kind of, we don't know exactly what species it is, but it's quite tropical looking. Um, this is a, a tropical climbing fern and that is found from the area of the, the picture that I keep showing you from the Wind River Basin. Um, and then here's a nice, a nice equisetum, a nice horsetail. Okay, so plant fossils are pretty abundant, pretty easy to collect. Insect fossils, on the other hand, they're awesome or they're non-existent. Okay, so we have amber deposits where you can just see every single perfect detail on those insects. Um, and you know, you get hun over a hundred million year old insects with just every hair preserved. Now we do in Wyoming have insect faunas that are not in amber. So in our, our um, Green River deposits where that, that uh, palm fronds that I showed you, there's also a beautiful insect record from there. But you don't get the same ability you do with plants to be able to look at, you know, lots of different sites that are closely spaced in space and time. And so what, what my colleagues and I have turned to is looking at plant fossils for records of insects. And so here we are in a modern forest and you look up and you see the leaves and then you see the parts that are missing or damaged on the leaves. And so there's a incredible diversity of ways that insects are accessing plant tissues. They're chewing on them and removing the tissue in holes or along the margin. Insects and other arthropods can induce galls to form on leaves. And so you can think about a gall as a plant tumor. And we still have a lot of work to do to understand the process by which this occurs, but a female insect lays an egg in the leaf and something about that process induces the plant to make this gall tissue around the egg. And now meanwhile, egg hatches, the insect larvae is protected from the scary world outside and it happily eats the gall tissue, grows bigger and eventually hatches out of the gall. <clears throat> what we're seeing over here, this is a leaf vine, and it's kind of a similar idea. So we have a female insect that laid an egg in the leaf, and then the egg hatches, and that little larvae is tunneling its way through the leaf, eating and pooping, getting bigger as it goes, hence the bigger poop trail. And then it eventually hatches out of the leaf, either as a later instar or as an adult. Okay, so you walk around a modern forest, you will see these kinds of interactions and they get preserved in the fossils. And so we see here's a beautiful example of a hole that's been chewed in a leaf. And we recognize that it was chewed during the life of the leaf because you see that thickened tissue around the hole. So it's only damage uh, if we see, or it's only insect damage if we see that thickened tissue. Okay, and some fun examples of galls and mines that I found on fossil leaves. Now, sometimes in very rare cases, you catch the insect in the culprit. You catch the culprit uh, in action. And so here what we have, these are little scale insects that have been preserved on 22 million year old leaves from Ethiopia. And so here's a cross section of what's going on. Here's the scale insect. It's got this little drinking straw mouth part that punctures the leaf and is sucking out the goodies. Sometimes we're lucky enough to see super diagnostic damage that we can then tie to a particular insect group. 
And so this is great work by Gussie McCracken and colleagues where she found this leaf with this really cool damage. She spent a lot of time looking at herbarium sheets, looking at, um, at modern ecological records and trying to understand what insect was doing this. And she was eventually able to track it down to this particular critter right here. So here it is as the larvae that makes that sort of a leaf mine. And there it is as an adult. Okay, and then just for funsies, this is one of my favorite ecological stories. Okay, so we have, it's a story about a fungus, an ant, and a leaf. So this particular fungus attacks the ant. So the spores of the fungus land on the ants. It's releasing enzymes. It's eating its way through the ant. It's releasing chemicals that go to the ant's brain and take over its brain and turn it into a zombie. And it gives the commands to the ants of, you will go 25 centimeters above the forest floor. You will get on the underside of the leaf where you'll be less visible to other things and it's a little bit more humid. Um, you will bite down on the leaf so that you can suck in, or not sucking, you can eat nutrients from the leaf while I continue to take over your body, kill you, and make offspring. So, the fungus eventually, um, it makes this, this uh, I don't know what you call this structure, this stalk here. And there is a, um, a, a sac that has lots of fungal spores in it. That sac will burst, fungal spores will get released on to infect other ants. Okay, I bring this up in addition to it being a really awesome story of what we call these tritrophic interactions. So three different levels. Because we have, well, not me personally, but Hughes and colleagues have found fossil leaves with this really interesting damage on them. And so you see these bite marks that are on major veins of the leaf. And we compare these fossil bite marks to modern bite marks from that interaction that I just told you about. And it seems like a pretty darn good match there. So super cool story, especially because um, this particular fossil comes from Messel in Germany and it's like 45 million years old. Um, and today where you find that interaction occurring is in Thailand. Okay, so that's like our cool stories of, you know, sometimes we can't actually pin down the groups. But a lot of times we can't. We see this beautiful damage. So like over here, we have a case where an insect has chewed the soft tissues and left the veins behind. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of different insects that can do that. And so then that raises the question of, you know, how do we use this data? What can we learn from it, even if we don't know what insect group is doing this? And so this right here, this is, I would, I could call it the Bible of my field. It's the Insect Damage Guide, which was uh, first conceived by Conrad Labandera and colleagues. And so just like we would have species of plants or species of insects, we could think about these species of damage. We call them damage types or DTs. And so you have like different, different sizes of holes, different shapes of holes, different morphologies of feeding along the margin of the leaf, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we look at our leaves, we figure out which of these different damage types are on them. And then we can think about for our entire flora or for a particular species in a flora, how abundant is the damage? What's its frequency? Um, what different types of damage do we see? Damage composition. And how many different types of damage do we see, which is damage diversity? And then one last thing we can do, and thank you digital cameras and image analysis software, is it's now really easy for us to measure what proportion of leaf area is being damaged by insects. 
So this is another uh, standard tool for my lab group. And it's important to understand like, what are these DTs? What do they represent biologically? And there was a beautiful, beautiful work by uh, Dr. Monica Carvalho. This was when she was doing her master's degree, trying to make the link between DTs and um, the, the richness of, of chewing DTs and the richness of insects that are making those chewing marks. And so she worked in modern forests in Panama. She went two sites. She went up in the canopy crane, would beat the leaves. She had the, this like kite thing underneath it. Um, sorry, I'm a paleontologist, entomologist in the audience. You would have more technical terms. But so Monica's beating the trees with the kite underneath it, catching the insects, and then growing, uh, putting the insects in bags with leaves of the tree that they came off of. She could then observe those leaves and see what different DTs were found and how many different insects were there. Okay, so she could make this graph of insect richness versus the DT richness. And each point is a species. And then she looked at two different forests, so that's why there's two different colors. And we see this very strong correlation between the diversity of, or the richness of insects, the number of insects, and the number of DTs that they're making. Okay, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation because you have convergence in mouth parts. And so you have some DTs that are made by many, many different insect species. And you also have some insects that can make multiple DTs. Okay, so it's not a perfect correlation. It's not a one-to-one -one correlation, but it's a strong correlation. So as damage richness is going up, that tells us that insect herbivore richness is also going up. So a lot of my research has focused on looking at that paleogene fossil record in Wyoming and trying to understand how temperature and carbon dioxide levels are affecting these plant insect ecosystems. All right, so if I could make some hypotheses. So first off, thinking about temperature. As we increase temperature, we might expect our uh, metabolic rates in the plants to increase, but we would also expect water stress of those plants to increase. So I might not expect to see big changes in plants. So that's my hypothesis. As far as insects, you're increasing temperature, and again, their metabolic rates are deep, or sorry, are increasing. And a really important consequence to that is that larval development time is going to decrease. And insects are most vulnerable when they're larvae. So we might expect increasing insect populations if more of those larvae are growing to adulthood. The insect life cycle also in, uh, decreases. And so you could get more generations of insect per year. Okay, so we might expect an increase in insect populations. All right, thinking about plants, insects, and herbivory. Okay, so historically, well, no, not historically, we know this is still true. So plant and insect diversity is higher in the tropics than in the temperate zone. And we might expect as temperatures increase, these more diverse populations can move up into the temperate zone into Wyoming. Okay, this is historically, um, we have thought that rates of herbivory are highest in the tropics. This is controversial. Um, and there's a lot of really, really neat work being done now to investigate that. But if that is true, then we might also expect as temperature increases, these rates of herbivory to go up. And then thanks to looking at the quaternary fossil record, those ice ages, we know that both plants and insects can migrate quite quickly. Okay, so I might expect herbivory to increase and in diversity of plants and insects to increase with temperature. Okay, thinking about carbon dioxide levels. So for plants, CO2 is what they eat. So we might expect more plant biomass. However, something really important is that the nutrient content of plants decreases 
as CO2 goes up. And this is true for many different plants. It's been shown experimentally. Um, and so potentially insects would need to be eating more to meet their nutritional needs if plants are getting less nutritious. As far as we know, CO2 does not directly affect insects. Okay, so we might expect herbivory to increase at higher CO2 levels. Um, and just, I, I had alluded to, you know, that plants getting less nutritious. This is some of the really neat work that's been being done on that, um, both showing that a lower nutritive value of plants, but then also this was a really neat study um, showing, it was a modeling study and trying to estimate how much more of our agricultural plants will be lost to insect feeding as climate warms. Okay, so I take my work, you know, it's very different plants that I'm working on that are, are agricultural plants, but I think they're important lessons we can learn. So just a, a brief vignette of what we've learned from fossils. So this work was done in the Bighorn Basin in Northwestern Wyoming. And over the time interval that I've studied, so we have this gradual warming event, and then we have this very abrupt global warming event 56 million years ago, right at the Paleocene-Eocene boundary. And we call that event the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. We don't know what exactly caused that big temperature change at the PETM. We know it was caused by the release of carbon into the atmosphere. If you look at the chemistry of rocks and living things during this time period, we see there's a change in the carbon isotopes. And that tells us that this new carbon that's different isotope ratios than what we generally had was released into the atmosphere. So big burp of carbon, big temperature change, big change in our floras. We go from having pretty low diversity floras with a lot of conifers to higher diversity floras with tropical looking things and lots and lots of legumes. And then after that global warming event and that CO2 burp, we see the floras go back to almost exactly what they were before the PETM. And this is work that I've been collaborating with Scott Wing at the Smithsonian on for many, many years. Okay, so that's our plant story. And this is, you know, taking those plants, the vertebrate paleontologists have also worked quite a lot on this PETM events, taking the sedimentology, paleoclimate reconstructions, and trying to um, show how the paleo environment changed through time. And so here in the late Paleocene, it was a warm, humid time. We had whatever these little critters are running around. Then we hit the PETM and it becomes warmer, it becomes seasonally dry, and we have all these bean trees and a more open canopy. We also have our first appearance of lots and lots of different mammal groups. This is the first time that you see um, even-toed ungul ungulates, odd-toed ungulates, and primates in North America. And then we go into the post-PETM early Eocene. We see that the forests look pretty similar, but the vertebrates have continued on their trajectory to the modern. These, these guys do not leave again. Okay, let's look at our herbivory story. And so what we see, so remember I showed you that, that gradual warming, there's a little cooling in it. There's the PETM in it. Our PETM is this red symbol here. Um, and so we can look at how the number of damage types changes through this interval. We can look at how the percent of leaves with damage changes through this interval. And then we can look at leaf area damaged. And that's time consuming and hard work. So we, we don't have that data for all the floras. Okay, but what we see 
is that when it's warm, you get a higher diversity of damage. So these are two warm sites, our PETM site. Um, we see there's more leaves with damage during those warm times. And we see interestingly, okay, so during this warm time, you don't get a huge burst in leaf area damage, but during the PETM you do. Okay, so what's going on here? So first off, um, so this was my PhD work, you have this incredible relationship between the temperature that we construct for our floras and what percent of leaves have damaged and how many damage types we see standardized for the number of leaves we're looking at. So back to our hypotheses. So that warming is potentially increasing our insect metabolic rates, decreasing the generation time, potentially increasing our insect population densities. We can also think about that nutrient content. So we might expect less nutritious leaves as CO2 levels rise. High CO2 levels, high temperatures, insects have to eat more to fulfill those nutrient requirements. And then last, we're probably looking at a migration story. And we know this is what we're looking at for the plants. Those plants that we've managed to identify and place in the taxonomic framework um, are things that are coming from like dry tropical Mexico and the Caribbean. So as the plants are migrating, the insects are potentially migrating with them. Okay, but there's this really weird thing going on with why are the PETM leaves so much more chewed? Um, and Scott and I banged our heads about this for quite a long time because it's not temperature, it's not CO2. This site is even warmer uh, than this site is. If it's warmer, it presumably has a higher CO2 level. But what makes the PETM in the Bighorn Basin so unique is having all of these legume leaves. And as any good vegetarian knows, you eat your legumes to get your proteins since you're not eating meat proteins. Okay, so there was an amazing paper by Adams and colleagues that is called, it's like, legumes are different. And they documented that legumes do in fact have higher nitrogen values in their leaves than other plants. And the reason for that is because legumes have symbioses with nitrogen fixing bacteria. Okay, so our hypothesis is that you have all of these legumes, they have this symbiosis, symbiosis, they have higher nitrogen contents in their leaves, their leaves are getting shed, getting incorporated into soils, and that nitrogen is then available for other plants as well. And so you could have this, this ecosystem buffering of, of decreased nutrient values during the PETM. And so just a, a fun little tangent here. So I had this hypothesis from the Bighorn Basin. Um, and it's, yeah, so this is, this is just looking at the Bighorn Basin right here. Um, yeah, and so if we look at, you know, what percent of the flora is associated with nitrogen fixing bacteria, so legumes, um, it's important to mention that we do also have allness in our floras. And alder is another taxa that has these nitrogen fixing symbionts. And so we see that as you have more nitrogen fixing plants, you have more area damaged. And now this is looking at mean annual temperature versus the proportion or the percent of individuals that are nitrogen fixing. And we see that as temperature increases, we get more nitrogen fixers. Um, and so that's kind of a cool thing uh, to, to think about as well. And that, um, you know, this would be really interesting to start testing more experimentally and looking at modern systems and seeing if this is the case. So do these nitrogen fixers have a competitive advantage at high temperature and high CO2 levels? Okay, so that, that is the story that, I, that I've crafted to share with you all today. So just uh, some conclusions, wrapping it all up together. So for our first part of the talk, I think the take home message is 
that there's power in looking silly and not caring that you do. That, that has been our mantra at the Bearded Lady Project team. And then scientifically, so plant fossils are awesome. They're super fun to collect. I love being out in the field. Uh, plant fossils are beautiful and they provide direct evidence of fossil food webs, which is really quite rare. And so by looking at these plant fossils, we can document insects being present without actually having the body fossils of the insects. And we can also look at how insect feeding on our plants has changed through time. And then we have our story of, you know, what has happened in the past as temperature and CO2 levels have changed and how might this help us prepare for where we're going. And so in our PETM story, we saw that plants and insects are changing where they live. They're migrating, but we don't see extinctions. We, and then we see this burst of herbivory during the PETM. But something that I, I glossed over in the interests of time is that warming during the PETM is much, much slower than it is today. Um, that CO2 burp happens at about a tenth to a hundredth of the rate that we are burning fossil fuels today. So it, it you know, it's a uh, informative. It gives us hope, but just keep in mind it's not exactly the same. Okay, and so then with that, I would just like to have some acknowledgments. So on the Bearded Lady Project, we're heavily funded by NSF, the Paleo Society and our parents who gave us the seed money for Lexi to come out in the field with me the first time. Um, and then as far as the science team, so Scott Wayne, Conrad Bandera, and Peter Wolf have been my colleagues and collaborators since I was in graduate school. And then I've had a bunch of wonderful undergraduates, Carrie, Rachel, Andrew, and Hillary, who did all of that very time-consuming, tedious measurements of, of leaf area damage and let us make this really, really interesting PETM story. Okay, and so with that, I will open it up for questions. Well, thank you very much for that wonderful talk, Dr. Curano. And we do have a series of questions, so I'll, I'll read them out to you and you can answer them. So our first question is, does the dominance of the insects and arthropods in general along the measures of biomass and species diversity extend all the way back to the Carboniferous? And if so, why haven't mass extinctions like the Permo-Triassic, for example, changed the pattern of arthropod dominance? So no, no easy questions right out of the gate. No, this is a great question. And I, I will have to admit that most of my work has taken place during the Cenozoic, not in the Carboniferous. Um, but the Carboniferous is just such a cool time period. Um, uh, and of course you have the giant dragonflies there. Yes. You know, okay, so I feel like, okay, I'm not gonna answer this question. I, that is, that is a given. But as, f you know, diversity, I think we can look at pretty well in the past. Biomass is going to be really, really hard to get at in the past because of the biases in the fossil record. And notably, you know, you're missing the small and squishies. So I don't know that we would be able to get a good estimate of how much biomass insects made up during the Carboniferous. Um, yeah, that, 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 that's what I've got for you right now. Um, I mean, I would, I would hypothesize that as far as at least plant biomass, it would probably be pretty similar to what it is today. Although of course there are questions as far as so the plants that were making up our Carboniferous rainforests are very different from the plants that are making up our rainforests today. So in the Carboniferous, we have all of these giant club mosses versus today we have angiosperms. And angiosperms are more efficient um, and more diverse than 
any other plant group. Um, and so there might be more biomass of angiosperms in our modern tropical forests than there was biomass of, of our, um, our giant club mosses. So that I recognize that was very unsatisfying. I think it would be fun to like sit down and talk about this for an hour and see if, you know, how far could we extrapolate things? It's, it's certainly a very difficult question to ask and answer. So <laughs> I'll, I'll shoot you something a little bit easier here. What plant fossil have you found or been involved with that excited you the most? Oh, I, I get questions like this a lot. And it's, it's, this is also a hard question to answer because of the quantity of plant fossils that we find. And so, you know, in a typical summer of field work, I will find thousands of plant fossils. Okay, but let me think about what, what's, what's my favorite one. I mean, I, I really think, okay, I'm gonna give two. So number one is we were working in the Miocene in Ethiopia and it's this beautiful lake deposit. The leaves are beautiful, they're complete. They still have the, their waxy coating preserved. And when we took them home and put them under a microscope, you could see the cell structure. You could see all the stomata, you could see the hairs, you could see the epidermal cells. And so it was this amazing site. It was the first time we were there, we were splitting leaves and it was amazing. And I was like, I'm gonna find a leaf as big as my head. And then I split a rock and it was a nice big rock. And I did find a leaf that was as big as my head. And so we nicknamed that leaf type Ellen's head. I have gotten this into the literature. Um, and we initially thought that this leaf was in the elephant ear family, that it was, you know, for those of you, you like this is a really popular plant in your dentist's office because they're, um, you've got like the leaves all come to the base together. They have big petioles and they have big showy leaves. And we had even found one of these specimens where we had what we thought was all of the leaves coming to the base and then coming off. Well, it turns out my colleague, Aaron Pan, did the detailed taxonomy work on this. And he found this was not the elephant ear family. It was a completely different family. And we were not looking at these little herbaceous plants. We were looking at these giant trees, which have huge compound leaves. So what we thought was the base that went into the ground was instead, you know, where the, the compound leaf flits all come together. Okay, and maybe I'll just stop with that being my favorite so we can have another question. Great, okay, so the next question is, uh, I think regarding the PETM and elevated CO2 levels. So I'll read the question, but then I'll expand it just a little bit. So the question as written is, could the increase in CO2 levels be the result of volcanic activity? And I'll expand to what, what are some of the hypotheses out there for the source of the CO2 increase yeah. for the PETM? Absolutely. Um, so I talked about the, the chemistry of the rocks and the, and the living things. And what we've observed is that the carbon isotopes um, change during this event. And the um, you get more carbon-12 relative to carbon-13. Carbon-12 is um, quite abundant in living things. Um, and then also methane tends to have more carbon-12 than carbon dioxide does. Okay, so that gives us two classes of hypotheses, one of which is that it's methane. And you have methane that's trapped in ice. It's called a clathrate. And so if you ever see a picture of what looks like a cube of ice burning, what you're seeing is, of course, not the H2O burning, but the CH4 or the methane burning. And so we have all these clathrates that are um, on the ocean floor. And if you have a destabilization, say warming 
prior to the PETM that could destabilize, destabilize the clathrate and cause this um, bubbling of methane up into the atmosphere. So that was one of the first hypotheses that was put forward. Another methane hypothesis is that it's coming out of permafrost and peats. We see this occurring today. Um, peat deposits and permafrost are a huge methane sink. And uh, we really need to, to, to cut our, our fossil fuel emissions and cut our warming so we're not releasing all this methane at high latitudes. Um, but anyway, so that has been proposed. We don't really have a good handle on during this really, really warm paleogene, did you have significant um, permafrost deposits? Okay, then we can turn to that carbon dioxide source and uh, potentially living things. So this interval here is when there was a huge amount of volcanism going on in the North Atlantic. We call it the North Atlantic Igneous Province. So there was just lots and lots of magma cutting up through Earth's crust, belching out. So that's releasing CO2. But then also the magmas are cutting through layers oil shale layers. And so they're burning the oil in there, which comes from living things. So we would expect it to be lighter. And then that, that burning of the oil shales is releasing CO2 into the atmosphere. So those are kind of the big hypotheses and it's still being really, really vigorously debated. Great, excellent answer. Um, so uh, another question here for you. Are the insect damage types in leaves uh, regarded as ichnofossils or are they described in that way or are they completely separate from that system? Uh, they are ichnofossils. And yeah, so like the paper that I showed by Gussie McCracken and colleagues, um, when she wrote that up, you know, she, she described it exactly like you would any other ichnofossil. Um, yeah. Great. Um, another one here. As the majority of plants during the Paleogene were C3 plants, how does the drastically different climate and insect interactions affect photorespiration? Um, okay, I'm trying to... Yeah, that, that's... Uh... Okay, first off, I need to think about... Okay, so by photorespiration, we're talking about during, wait, I'm sorry, I'm slightly brain dead. Photorespiration, that is when, like during photosynthesis, the um, chloroph the, um, the, the, the oxygen is getting incorporated instead of CO2, is that? Is that what photorespiration means? Yeah, it's it's that part of the the, yeah. the metabolic system. Um, okay, yeah, and then with C four plants, they have the the pathway in place that 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 keeps photorespiration lower with the yes, yeah. Cells. Okay, this is all coming back now. Okay. Well, now I've had my embarrassing crash course on this. Um. <laughs> Okay, clearly this is not something that I've thought about before, but I think this would be really interesting to consider how, how rates of photorespiration change with temperature change. Um, I'm sorry, I've, I've really got nothing here. <laughs> oh, you know, I, I don't think I'd be able to come up with an answer either. It's, it's a very unique perspective uh, to, to think about in terms of all the various interactions and, yeah, and, and totally. you know, synthesis there. So I, I'm not sure any answer we would give would be even satisfactory anyways. <laughs> um, so I'll move on to another one here. Have you encountered any damage types in the fossil record that are not found in modern leaves? I will give that a definite maybe. Um, and so, with 
you know, with a lot of like the chewing damage, you know, that you're finding across modern leaves, fossil leaves, whatever. As far as kind of the more specialized mine and gall types, I would absolutely bet that we do. However, we have a little bit of a disconnect between what those of us working in the fossil record are doing and those of us working in modern systems are doing. And it can be really hard to find the, the literature on what are all of the modern damage types that exist. You know, I think about Gussie's work and she found that super cool leaf mine. And then it was, you know, a year of on and off searching through herbarium records, searching through literature references and trying to find things. Now, thankfully there's a lot of super awesome um, entomologists working in modern systems. And so kind of my default is I find something and I'm like, ooh, friend who, who works in the modern, have you ever seen anything that looks like this? Um, but yeah, it, it can be really challenging to track down these particular damage types in the modern. Yeah, for sure. I'm going to use my moderator's privilege to ask a question. Go for it. Um, so in the neogene, a lot of our, our trees that are producing amber are the legumes, um, such as the big deposits in the Dominican. When you see an influx of legumes into the Wyoming region during the PETM, is there any evidence that, that they're also producing amber? Do you find an increase in like little amber nodules in association or is there no amber at all in, in your deposits? There's not much amber in our deposits. And I don't honestly know if that is because it's not being produced or it's not being preserved. Um, and so in, so I, in the places where, where I have found the most amber and I mean, Christopher, like you were alluding to, like, I'm not finding big chunks with beautiful insects in them. I'm just finding little tiny bits. Um, but so the rocks that I've worked in that have the most amber are very coaly rocks, yeah. very waterlogged environments, really, yeah, carbonaceous shales. Um, and in the PETM, in the Bighorn Basin, we do not have that kind of rock. Yeah. So there's this combination of you get seasonal drying, and then also there's been some really neat work done trying to look at microbial activity during the PETM and how that might compare with other time periods. And just in general, there's a very little organic matter preserved during the PETM in the Bighorn Basin. And the hypothesis is that you have more microbial activity that's digesting things and potentially right. digesting the amber. Great. One final question for you, and I think this relates to the parasitoid fungus. Has any evidence of that been found in the paleogene of the Wyoming? No, I would love to. Yeah, I bet. Remember to attend next week as we have Elsa Pancharoli from Oxford University Museum of Natural History giving a presentation entitled uh, Beasts Before Us, The Untold Story of Mammal Evolution. So that'll be next week, same time and day. Um, and we have no further questions. So I'd like once again to thank you so much, uh, Ellen, for giving us such a, a wonderful presentation. Uh, very much appreciated. You bet. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for sticking through.